Five disturbing police cover-up cases. Police swear to protect and serve, but this doesn't mean the system doesn't have its flaws. In fact, in some cases, they're the ones breaking the law. The cases on this list are truly appalling, even alarming. These are five disturbing police cover-up cases. Number five, Jody Hooson Truitt. It was June 27, 1995. 27-year-old Minnesota native Jody Hooson Truitt called her producer at KIMT-TV saying she had overslept and was heading into the office. As a TV reporter, Jody was due to be on screen by 6 a.m. By 7 a.m., co-workers had called police asking for a welfare check on her. When they got there, they found Jody's car still parked at her apartment complex. On the ground was a hair dryer, a pair of red shoes, along with a bottle of hairspray. There was a palm print on her car and signs of a struggle were present. Police believe she may have been abducted as she was unlocking her vehicle. A week before her disappearance, Jody was seen water skiing at Coralville Lake with John Van Syce. He has become the primary person of interest in the case because he was the last person to see Jody alive. Vances cooperated with police but kept mum about the case. Many saw his silence as guilt. And after 20 years of silence, Vances finally released a statement through media consulting executive Steve Ridge. In it, he denied involvement in Jody's disappearance. He said he had submitted requests for DNA and fingerprints at least twice by local, state, and federal police and says ever since Jody's disappearance, he has lived in a suspended hell. Since 1995, Jody's family has hired private investigators, consulted psychics, and pursued every lead possible. Police and private investigators interviewed over 1,000 people, but not one pointed to any conclusive evidence leading to a suspect. Jody was legally declared dead in May of 2001. Then in 2016, controversy erupted after retiring state representative John Kuiker of Sioux County, who was trying to gather attention in the Jody case in its 20th anniversary, was rebuffed by local police and Mason city officials. He sent a letter asking to recognize the 20th anniversary and appeal to the public for more information, but was begged to withdraw the letter and not send it to the media. The adverse reaction made him question and ask if there's something being covered up in the case. In 2011, a former local cop, Maria Ohl, came forward and alleged that two other Mason officers were behind the abduction of Jody in 1995. She said she got the information from a credible informant. She first learned of it in 2007 and heard of it again in 2009, but said nothing has been done with the information. In March of 2017, a warrant was released against John Van Cease, asking for GPS data for two of his vehicles. But for a third time, the information gathered was sealed by a judge and kept hidden from the public. The warrant will be unsealed in September of 2020. Some people are questioning this move and believe there might be a cover-up happening behind the scenes after all. Number 4. Matt Lawson At 14 years old, Matt Lawson was working part-time for a cleaning crew in Biddeford, Maine. In 2000, Matt was cleaning a bank parking lot when a stranger, Michael McCone, offered to get him food from a Burger King. Matt declined, but McCone got him food anyway. After he was done cleaning, the two headed towards McCone's house. Matt entered the home, but once inside, McCone initiated oral sex on him. Matt recalls leaving the home crying. He kept the abuse a secret. And months later, McCohen would call Lausen's home, prompting his father to call police and report it. Apparently, McCohen was on the sex offender registry. Two police officers came and took the report, and they asked Matt if he was abused, but he was too embarrassed to admit anything and denied it. One of the supervising officers that signed off on the report was Sergeant Stephen Dodd. Later that year, Dodd contacted Matt via instant message, saying he knew what happened to McCown. Matt thought it meant the officer would help him. Sergeant Dodd picked him up in a civilian vehicle, but drove past the police station and onto a dirt road past the town line. There, the officer told him 
it was okay to be gay and proceeded to perform oral sex on him. This pattern of abuse went on several times. When Matt finally refused to see Dodd, the officer would park his cruiser outside their home and flash his lights, threatening him. It took years for Matt to find the courage to tell anyone of the abuse he suffered under the officer. He filed a report in October 2014. An officer took it, but he never heard anything back. After no action from the Attorney General's office, Matt took his story to Facebook. To his surprise, he found other victims, not just of Officer Dodd, but of another officer on the force, Captain Norman Gaudet. Apparently, Sergeant Dodd had had a history of abuse filed against him, but the police chief, Roger Beaupre, and the entire department didn't do anything to stop the abuse or remove the officer from their duty. In 2015, even Maine Attorney General Janet Mills refused to file charges against Dodd and McCown, citing insufficient evidence. Another victim, Bert Gerard, came forward in 2016. He says Dodd assaulted him when he was 14 or 15 years old. Dodd would visit their home offering clothes and alcohol. He offered Gerard a place to stay, and that's when the abuse started. Four years later, and the case is still ongoing. There are four separate civil rights lawsuits against Dodd and Gaudet, two for each. Lawson also discovered during the lawsuit filing that several key documents regarding the previous abuse complaints against the officers have gone missing. Talk of a cover-up by the local police, even those in the town who knew of the system of abuse happening but decided not to do anything or speak up is speculated. But there is some hope for the case. A motion to dismiss the lawsuit against the Bitterford officers was denied by U.S. District Judge D. Brock Hornby. The judge cited that the statute of limitations doesn't bar any claims of sexual abuse. Matt Lawson can finally look forward to his day in court. Despite the various roadblocks thrown in by the city, they are moving forward with the case. Number 3. John Burge A veteran of the United States Army, Captain John Burge, served tours in Vietnam and South Korea. After his service, he started his career as a police officer in the Chicago PD. It was here his reign of terror started. Starting in 1972, when he was just 24 years old, up until 1991, Burge directly participated or approved the torture of over 118 to 120 individuals held in police custody. Many of his victims were young black men. Burge and his henchmen called themselves the Midnight Crew and Burge's Ass Kickers. Their main method of torture involved suffocation, burning, beating, and sending an electric shock to the mouth and genitals of the victims, among others. On February 9, 1982, two officers were shot down and killed. Burge wanted to capture the suspect and instigated a dragnet of sorts picking up suspects and arresting them. Each suspect was then tortured in various ways. Some were held handcuffed to a single object for days, miners had guns held against their heads, while some had their pets violently killed in front of them. Despite protests, the arrests and torture continued. Soon Tyrone Sims identified Donald Kojak White as the main shooter. In turn, White was linked to brothers Andrew and Jackie Wilson, since the three had committed a robbery earlier that day. Both brothers were arrested for the murder on February 14, 1982. Wilson and his brother were tortured. Andrew was tortured with a cattle prod and suffered multiple lacerations on his head, face, chest, and had thigh burns, all of which forced him to admit to a murder he didn't commit. The doctor at the Mercy Hospital and Medical Center that attended to him at the end of the day sent a memo to Richard M. Daly, then the Cook County State Attorney, to investigate the matter on suspicion of police brutality, but it turns out Daly let it slide. The brothers were convicted of the killings. Andrew was sentenced to death while Jackie sentenced to life. Upon appeal, these were overturned or remanded. It wasn't until 1989 when Andrew Wilson filed a civil suit against four detectives, including Burge himself. The jury acquitted the other officers, but was indecisive about Burge. It would soon turn out Wilson wasn't the only torture victim. According to lawyer Flint Taylor, 
The torture cases involved an official cover-up and ran deeper than Burge. It involved various police superintendents, prosecutors, and over 30 police detectives and supervisors, especially the former mayor and state attorney, Richard M. Daly. Despite evidence, confessions against the brutality and the countless victims that came forward, Burge was never in prison for the torture crimes. Instead, he was in prison for perjury in 2008 and served only four and a half years in home confinement, not even in a real jail cell. He died in September of 2018 at the age of 70. Number 2. Sandra Bland In 2015, Sandra Bland was ready to start a new temporary job with Prairie View in Texas. Bland was known as a civil rights activist, often posting about police mistreatment of black people. On July 10, 2015, Texas officer Brian Encinia followed Bland around University Drive in Prairie View, Texas. The officers had a history of pretextual traffic stops, meaning he would use minor violations to stop a vehicle and search it, hoping to find something more criminal. That day, the officer closed in on Sarah's vehicle. Thinking the officer was in an emergency, Sarah switched lanes to give him right of way, but failed to signal before doing so. As a result, the officer pulled her over. As recorded by the officer's dash cam, Sarah's phone, and that of a bystander, the two got into a heated argument. The officer repeatedly told Sarah to step outside her vehicle, but she remained defiant. She finally stepped out when she was threatened to be tased if she didn't comply. The two were out of frame from the camera, but continued the argument. Sarah was forced on the ground, handcuffed, and then arrested. According to the DPS report, Bland was arrested after kicking Encinia and was charged with assaulting a public servant. Officers brought her to the Waller County Jail and placed her in a cell, alone, deeming her high risk to others. On July 13th at 6.30 a.m., Bland was offered breakfast but refused. Half an hour later, she told the jailer, I'm fine. At 9 a.m., Bland was found in a semi-standing position hanging in her cell. The next day, police issued a statement that Bland was discovered dead in her cell and they believed that she hanged herself. An autopsy revealed she died from asphyxiation after using a plastic garbage bag to suffocate and hang herself. There was a huge outcry over what had happened. Her family believed while she had ups and downs, she was not suicidal. The FBI and DPS launched their own investigation on Bland's death and Encinia was placed on admin duties for violating traffic stop procedures. He was terminated by DPS for perjury charges, which were later dropped. Those managing the jail, particularly the guards, were found to be in violation of failing to check on her in a timely manner. Various people claim a police cover-up occurred. This was further brought up when in May of 2019, a video recorded on Sarah Bland's cell phone of the encounter shows Officer Encinia pointing the stun gun at her and telling her to get out of the car. According to Canon Lambert, a lawyer representing the Bland family, despite claiming Encinia was in fear for his life, the video shows he wasn't in fear of his safety at all. Even more later examination showed discrepancies in the timeline provided by the jailers against the exact time Sarah died. She was also found to have high levels of THC in her system despite being in jail for three days. In the end, Sarah's family filed a federal wrongful death lawsuit and sought damages from DPS and Sunia, Waller County along with two jailers. They settled for $1.9 million in 2016. In 2017, the Sandra Bland Act went into effect. It mandated changes and corrections to police policy when dealing with people with mental and substance abuse issues. It also mandated de-escalation training for officers, which would have them trained to minimize the use of force. Number 1. Jason Van Dyke On October 20th, 2014, Chicago teen Laquan McDonald was walking in the middle of South Pulaski Road carrying a knife. He was breaking into vehicles and trucks in the area. About eight officers responded, including Officer Jason Van Dyke. 
As the officers confronted McDonald, he used the knife to slice a patrol vehicle's tires and damage its windshield. After multiple verbal instructions from the officers to drop the knife, McDonald started walking away. The dash cam video shows him doing this. At the same time, Officer Jason Van Dyke is seen advancing towards him. It was at this exact moment that he shot the teen. It hit McDonald and he spun to the ground while still holding the knife. As he lay there, Van Dyke fired 16 shots in a matter of 14 to 15 seconds. It was noted Van Dyke had only been on the scene less than 30 seconds before he opened fire. No other officer fired at the teen except for Van Dyke. Laquan McDonald was rushed to Mount Sinai Hospital where he was pronounced dead at 10.42 p.m. Toxicology reports later revealed the drug PCP, which causes erratic behavior among users, was present in McDonald's system. Initial police reports of the incident consisted of over 400 pages, both handwritten and typed. Many of the police supervisors ruled out the case as justifiable homicide. The reports painted McDonald as crazed and at some point lunged at the officers after he refused to drop his knife. One police report even said McDonald raised the knife to his chest and pointed to Van Dyke. In his initial statements, Van Dyke said he feared McDonald would rush at him and throw the knife his way. McDonald was being painted as a crazed aggressor who prompted Van Dyke to shoot him. But when the dash cam video, which was released a full year after the incident, was made public, it was clear this wasn't the case. Cries of a cover-up rang when the public and various groups saw what was in it. The length of time it was kept away from the public also caused a stir. It said there are five police videos taken of the incident, but three were not released. What's more, the video taken from Van Dyke's police SUV has no sound. Officials said it was a technical issue, but it was revealed the sound equipment in the SUV was intentionally damaged according to the technicians. Furthermore, a Burger King surveillance video is said to have captured the incident as well, but there was a gap of 86 minutes in the recorded footage when it was examined. The manager of the restaurant said five Chicago police officers had accessed the video and passwords on the equipment the night of the shooting, so by the time the Independent Police Review Authority got to it, it had been erased. It turns out Van Dyke has had about 20 complaints filed against him for excessive use of force. One victim even successfully won a suit. Prior to Van Dyke's sentencing, three Chicago police officers were found not guilty of covering up for Van Dyke. The officers had written reports about the incident supporting Van Dyke's account instead of what really happened. The three opted for a bench trial instead of a jury, and the judge acquitted all three. In October of 2018, Van Dyke was found guilty of second-degree murder for shooting Laquan McDonald 16 times. Although he was initially charged with first-degree murder, the jurors were instructed they can also consider second-degree. They opted for the latter. Although celebrations rang out when Van Dyke was found guilty, it soon soured when he was instructed to serve only 81 months in prison, or approximately 6 years 9 months. This includes the time he had served, and he is currently still in custody. So there were 5 disturbing police cover-up cases. Police cover-ups do happen more frequently than most imagine. While there are honest officials doing good work, there are always some bad ones willing to subvert the law just because they're in uniform. We have new videos every Wednesday and Saturday, so if you enjoyed this one, then please subscribe and hit the notification bell. Thanks for tuning in this week, and we'll see you soon.